Did anybody remember where we left off reading? That's what I thought. <clears throat> All right, page 16, the eyes of the disciples need to be open. Thank God for astute students. <laughs> All right. And, of course, uh, we're in uh, Luke 24, and we will refer to some things there, so if you want to go ahead and turn there also. Uh, the scripture that uh, is here on page 16 is uh, Luke 24, 15 through 16, and it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And this little section that we're going to get into here deals with several things. But I think the first thing that it deals with is just this thought of communing together, like what it says. It came to pass while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. <clears throat> so let me just read a little bit because uh, if we don't, there's almost 200 pages in this book. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> to make this journey to Emmaus, the disciples had to leave Jerusalem, Israel's center for religious activity. That they were leaving Jerusalem is significant because they were on a journey with a small group of disciples who were about to meet with Jesus in a whole new form. Though they loved the Lord, though they talked about the Lord, there was a problem which is revealed in verse 15 and 16. The lack in their lives what the, was that their eyes <clears throat> were restrained. Verse 15 also brings out their communion one with another. Notice that this communion did not require the presence of Jesus. Now, consider communion without the presence of Jesus. Just think about that thought for a minute since we are fellowshipping in his blood and in his body, true communion. Um, <clears throat> this little scene exactly represents what most bel believers conceive of communion to be. However, this kind of speaking together is not the table of the Lord and therefore is not what the Lord considers true communion. What they are partaking of here is common communion. Before this journey ends, these disciples will, will have had their eyes open to not only what true communion is, but will have experienced it. So they will have broken bread with Jesus, and in so doing, they will have changed from earth communion to real communion. <clears throat> Who could have explained to them before this journey began that simply discussing things no matter how intimate the conversation, is not the true communion. For years, everything that they had done had been centered on Jesus. They had only associated with people who loved Jesus. They had given time, energy, and effort for him. They had communed like few on the planet had communed, and yet, always and forever, when Jesus begins to open our eyes, we see from a whole new light. <clears throat> now, this is alluding to the scriptures that, uh, let's just look at uh, verse 30 and 31. And it came to pass as he, as he sat eating with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished out of their sight. And then also verse uh, 35, and they told what things were done along the way and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. <clears throat> so the reason why I'm giving any kind of attention to this thing of communion <clears throat> is because um, in Christian circles today, um, people use that word sort of freely. You know, I was communing with the Lord or a couple of brothers and sisters were sitting around communing together. And it all sounds very spiritual, but you have to understand Jesus instituted true communion. And he did it um, prior to his death and resurrection 
to signify what they needed to do, which was, you know, interestingly enough, in the upper room, Jesus didn't speak to them. I mean, you would think this is, this is it. This is the big moment. He's going to die for your sins. So he's going to sit there and he's going to say, okay, now I'm about to die on the cross and all your sins are going to be forgiven. That's not just yours, but everybody's. And salvation will come. He didn't even talk like that. We talk like that. And we get clouded from the scriptures and the true setting and meaning of the scriptures many times. We get clouded by the information that we have received prior to our reading that from religious people who have told us what's important and what is the thing that we should be getting out of this instead of consulting the Holy Spirit. And I say that because God blessed me to not have been in a religious atmosphere very long. But man, oh man, the little bit of time I was in there, I, was, I had so much to wash away that the Holy Spirit made, you know, like this chalkboard behind me, to erase everything that had been given by man and, and let me explain that. I mean, I'm a man, and I'm, I'm teaching you here. <clears throat> but, to, but when a person is teaching, you don't take everything that they say. You don't assume that even by understanding what they're saying, you're getting um, what is the Lord. For, for example, these guys are walking along, and Jesus draws near, and they don't, even, they don't even recognize Jesus, but they know how to talk about the death and resurrection, and so they start talking to him about it. <laughs> and they sort of get upset with him and say, well, what are you, some sort of stranger? You, you don't know what we know about the death and resurrection? Clearly, he knows a little more than they do about it. <clears throat> At a certain juncture, when they sit down and break bread. Okay, and there's a difference between uh, communing in the, in the natural, which is basically talking about the same subject, and maybe Jesus is the focal point. That, we call that communion. But he, here's, here's my point. He didn't talk about a big salvation. He said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. He said, this is my body, I'm breaking the one loaf that was me. I was the one loaf, and I'm breaking it now. I'm putting it in you, and you, and you, and you, and now my body is no longer one loaf me. It's one loaf in many. You are my body. Does that, does that make sense? And then he said, drink this blood, and if that blood was only about forgiveness of sins, now we know the blood is about forgiveness of sins. Don't ever let anybody take that from you, okay? I'm not trying to take that from you either. It, it, it's about, but that's not the only thing about, because if it's about forgiveness of sins, he would have said, you know, take this blood and dump it on top of your head and let it run down on the doorpost, and then when the death angel comes, he'll, wouldn't that make sense? I mean, wouldn't that really actually jive with the way things are presented. But Jesus completely blows everybody's mind and says, drink it, for the life is in the blood. Does not the scriptures declare that? The life is in the blood. Drink it. Put, it, put the life on the inside of you. Well, that's because, and you do know, that shortly after that is John 15, where he talks about the vine and the branches was all, you know, it, it was either in the upper room after they had communion and he washed their feet or on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. I think it, personally from my study, I believe it was on the way. He was talking about the vine and branches. <clears throat> you know, he's not going, okay, I'm going to die. They're going to beat me. 
And I just want to give you a little flash of what it's going to look like. And then he'd flash, you know, the passion of Christ with all these deep cuts. And, you know, you go, oh, my God. Yeah, I'm going to do this for you. So now that you're getting a little flash of what it's going to look like, you need to be committed to me for what I, you know, to the extent I've gone for you. He didn't do all that. You know what he talked about? He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Let me abide in you and you abide in me. It was a life exchange. It was a, a union. It was a relationship of oneness. Not just a relationship. It wasn't a relationship of Christianity to the master. It was a relationship of a vine to its branches. Well, what, what kind of relationship is that? One that flows into them and brings forth his stuff out of them. Well, most people are trying to bring forth their stuff to bring Jesus glory. Good stuff. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be good and this will bring you glory. Well, how's that working for you? You know, the whole reason he died on the crosses was because there was none good. But all of a sudden, we're good. No, 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 no. He didn't make us good. He made us dead. Amen. And he broke us off the old one. Therefore, we died to that old sap, that old nature, and grafted us into himself so that his life could come into each of us as a branch. So that, because see, we say, so that everybody can have the life of Jesus. There's a very specific reason to have the life of Jesus and that is so that he his life in these branches can bring forth his fruit for example the fruit of the spirit love joy peace gentleness meekness faith temperance long suffering you know you you consider that and we we start looking at that and we start working toward it Trying to, has anybody ever tried to be more loving? Has anybody tried to be more patient? And yet that doesn't say that's the fruit of the Christian. It's God in us. It's Christ in us. It's the life of, of the eternal. Bringing forth. He, you know, he could have brought forth any number of ways. You know, he could have skipped this whole thing, died on the cross, and then rose up long enough for everybody to see him in the heavens and then shot back down and put his foot on the Mount of Olives and split it wide open, and everybody would have wondered, yeah, he's the Savior of the world. He's the, he, he's, he gave us his life so he could save us. No, he gave us his life so he could be one with us because to him, this is way more intimate than it is for the average Christian. It is, could I say, it is special with him? Well, now, where would you get that from? Remember, we're talking about communion here. Jesus said to his disciples, I have with much desire desired to have this communion with you before my death before my departure well you know gee he must really be into rituals I mean right I mean he's going oh man I really like this ritual I mean I've been looking forward to doing the ritual with you his heart is way 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 beyond that he's not into rituals See, I just knew the light was going to finally come on to you folks over there. This is great. No, he, he said, I have with much desire, and I, this isn't the exact word, desired to commune with you over the things that will last, over the things that are eternal. And so 
for Jesus. You know, they're going, they're looking around going, you know, Jesus sitting there and they're eating and it's, they're doing the Passover thing and all that. And all of a sudden Jesus takes bread, which didn't have to do with the Passover and goes, okay, everybody attention. <coughs> this was my body <coughs> broken for you. What does that mean? Broken for your sins? No, no. broken so that, so that it can become uh, put in a form that you can partake of it. Isn't that cool? <laughs> That's really cool. I mean, you know, because it was broken and passed out so that we could take in this portion that represents that we are now the body of Christ. All we usually see in those symbols and all of that and the, the ritual is Jesus died for our sins and now we can feel better. But don't, don't eat the bread or drink the blood until you're really sorry for your sins. Really, that's, that's so common. You know, don't, ah, don't do it. You know, if you're not really repentant, then you, you'll go to hell if you eat it. I mean, it's almost put that way. That on no, some, it's very much put that way. yeah, you know, yeah. right. And so, you know, the, it's just this thing. It's become this deal about sins, but for Jesus. And again, now remember, remember, we're talking about communion here, and we're saying that communion to Jesus is much more than two people talking about his death and resurrection or communing over, even if they're the truth. And also remember that we're talking about, don't just listen to me or any of the teachers in this Bible school or any teachers, any or preachers anywhere without <coughs> saying as you <coughs> sit there or you attend whatever, that you say, Holy Spirit, may I not just attend a service. You are here. You know, we, and we say that, don't we? The Holy Spirit is here. But we're not really very much aware of that unless some big supernatural thing's going on. You know, then that starts with, oh, the Holy Spirit is here. Folks, he's here right now. And Jesus said, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. He will take that which is mine and show it unto you. His biggest ministry that Jesus talked about, Jesus didn't talk about jumping over pews or running around, you know. I mean, it's fine. I don't, I have, I'm, I don't have any problem with anybody doing whatever you feel like that's the Holy Spirit to do, but I'm telling you that Jesus. Now, don't, how many of us think Jesus is the center of everything? And if he is, then we probably ought to listen. And when you listen to him, he never mentioned tongues, not that I have a problem with that, or he never mentioned miracles, not that not, that's necessary. He never, you know, he never got into any of those things. But he did say, hey, when the Holy Spirit, i got to go away. That's what he said. I've got to go away because I'm going to send you somebody that will make you jump over pews or dance for three hours or whatever. He, he, Jesus doesn't talk like that. He says he's going to open your eyes. He's going to show that which is mine, that which is me unto you so that you will comprehend that the cross is more than a death for dogs. If I may put it like that. A death for dirty dogs. That's about all we, you know, thank God he said, you know. And yeah, I mean, I agree. Thank God he saved us. And yes, I was a dirty dog. But folks, you know, you were a sinner but you're not a sinner anymore. You're a saint, but, but what does that mean? I mean, what does that mean? Does, are you, honestly, would you, can you look in the mirror and remember how your life has gone the last two weeks and say, I'm a saint? You know? Well, there's only one way you'll be able to do that, and that is if you understand that you are that by Christ, by union with Christ, and are looking into this partaking, you know, I'm in him and he's in me. And I believe that more than I believe what I see, feel, taste, and touch. Is that a good idea? Because you can get down on yourself. Or you can open the door to the enemy to get down on you. 
Or the carnal mind can just rip you to shreds. Well, who do you think you are, you know? I mean, has the enemy ever hit any of you and said, what are you doing going to Bible school? You shouldn't have been there. You, you don't belong there. You know, there are some Bible schools that he never says that to the students. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is the place because he, you know, you know, there are cemetery, I mean, seminaries that, you know, are really just not pre presenting the life. But if we're going, and we're not the only ones that present the life, but if we're going to go, then we need to see beyond ourselves and we need to see Jesus. And we, and we need to see what's in the heart of Jesus. Amen. This whole Emmaus Road walk is a walk for the people of God, not for sinners, for disciples. It is a walk necessary because they spent three and a half years with Jesus of Nazareth with the, listen carefully, I'm not going to explain it, but it's in there and you should search it out. They spent three and a half years with the only begotten Son of God. But when he rose again, folks, he was no longer the only begotten. He was the firstborn from the dead. He was the firstborn among many brethren. The relationship was different. And so Jesus said, I've got to go away. Jesus of Nazareth has got to go away so that you can see the eternal resurrected Christ and the new relationship you have by oneness. There's a whole lot of people, folks, that are still following Jesus of Nazareth. They read the Gospels, and they try to copy their ministry after that. And, you know, that's fine. But Jesus is walking with those same disciples, trying to open their eyes to something more. All right. Now, let me just clarify. Are you saying, Randy, that there's going to there's gonna be no more miracles? No, I'm telling you, you know, I say this often. If it wasn't for miracles, this place wouldn't be around. And that is the truth. I don't know how we make it. I, it. I don't. It doesn't even make sense to me. I mean, if you ever watch the offering, <laughs> you just go, this is impossible. How in the world can you, you know, run anything based on, you know, two bucks in a, in a canasta, in a basket? <laughs> you know? Well... It's a miracle, and it's constantly miracles. I believe in miracles, but I believe that those things follow me while I follow Jesus. Jesus said these signs will follow you. He didn't say go chase after them. Right? I mean, he, didn't say cha he didn't say go after them. He said let them follow you while you follow me. So I just trust. I mean, I figure, you know, I mean, Jesus, you know, that, what was it? The, the psalm says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. Well, I tell you what, I, I question it sometimes. <laughs> but I don't look back. I figure they're back there. Right. You know, I mean, today, an impossible day. Trying to get my newsletter out. I'm already behind schedule. It's supposed to go out the first couple of days of, of the month. And trying to get it out had so much trouble with printing and getting it done over the last couple of days. So today, today is the day of victory. So I'm going to go use a, another computer, uh, my desktop computer, and I'm going to use it instead of my laptop, try to start it up, and it just sits there, you know, you know, everything looks like it's coming on and going to bling, but it just, you know, and it's showing the little letters that talks about, you know, we're coming up here and all that stuff. Never does anything. So after about 10 restarts and everything, I went, okay, back to the laptop. So I went to the laptop and got ready to print. And this is moments after the other one. Got ready to print. And we're talking also about two different computers, two different printers. Got ready to print, and it says, you have no printer initialized on your laptop. I'm going... You know, anybody talk to your computer? I do too. <laughs> what do you mean? You don't know. I know. I've used you before. Many times. 
But it's telling me I don't, that there is no print. So I go look under the printer thing. Doesn't even have one, you know. So I check another thing, and yeah, it's in there, but it's like not showing up, but it's, it was never. So I have to uninstall it. And I'll tell you something about this printer. I don't know what the deal is, but it takes two hours to install. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> I'm going, how much of this, what are you putting on my computer? <laughs> Honestly, you know, you know. For, for, yeah, for, forget the newsletter. Jesus will be back before. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> but you know, and and uh, so I'm, you know, I'm. I decide, okay, I'm gonna uninstall. And in the meantime, I got in the Word and was just because I know you don't just sit there and do this, you know. So I'm, you know, I've got it right here, but I'm studying. I'm, you know. And uh, when I get done uninstalling and installing, I printed one page of a two-page newsletter, front and back, one front and back of one page. And then it was time to go, to come here. But just before I shut it down, this little thing comes up and says, you have a virus on your computer. Now, I'm, I have got the best... <laughs> Norton, brand new, highest, most expensive protection, and three other things, including the original that came with that laptop that had expired two years ago, and guess which one brought up that I had a virus? The expired one. And I'm going, I just, you know, and it's, it's a McAfee, it's not even Norton. I'm going, I, I just want to sue these Norton people. You know, they, they make you feel like you got the best and everything. So, you know, I dealt with it through an outdated system, you know. They're, they are back there. <laughs> they're, they're not right here. Goodness and mercy, they're not right here, but they're back there. <laughs> and I'm sure they're having a good time looking forward going, <laughs> Maybe we need to get up there with him. <clears throat> All right. I, I need to read. What has happened here? <laughs> we were going to read this class, remember? How far did we get? Did we even get very far? You know, I don't even think we made three paragraphs. Let's... Uh, Top of 17, who could have explained to them? Okay, that was where we were reading, and then I think I stopped. <clears throat> who could have explained to them before this journey began that simply discussing things, no matter how intimate the conversation, is not the true communion? For years, everything that they had done had been centered on Jesus. Let's see. Let's look at the last sentence. Uh, they had communed like few on the planet had communed, yet always and forever when Jesus begins to open our eyes, we see from a whole new light. And that's really the point, folks. We need the Holy Spirit to teach us Christ. Because we, our knowledge is blocking us from knowing him in a living, immediate way. All right, next paragraph. To see the Lord in this way is not just a better light, but totally other. It is so different from any other relationship and is so far above whatever we could have imagined. When Christ is made known to us. Now, let me, let me explain what I mean by that. And I know I need to read. Someone can hear that. Let's see. Uh, it is so different from any other relationship and so far above whatever we could. Have. Someone could hear that and go, oh, you think you have something so far above anybody else. That's not what that's saying. And that's, I wrote this. So I know what it's saying. That's saying that when the Holy Spirit shows you Jesus, it is far above what I think I know. And what you think you know. I don't have a corner on the truth. I'm not even pointing you to my truth. I have been pointing you to the Holy Spirit to show you the truth. I mean, did anybody catch that? That I'm actually not talking about what I know. 
but about what he knows and let him teach you. Okay? <clears throat> and we say, well, I'm doing that. Well, do it harder. I mean, you, you know what I mean? I mean, go harder for the Lord because he's worth it, if nothing else. Um, <clears throat> in a great sense, this new understanding concerning communion is more of a breakthrough than what many understand a breakthrough to be. They will not go back to Jerusalem to commune in the old manner, for they will never again leave the table of the Lord, meaning they, have part they were partaking, and then they saw the Lord in it, and then they're going to live that way from now on. As the disciples walked along the road, I'm sure that they did not think that their communion was any less because of Jesus' absence. And again, how can you have true communion without Jesus, without his, his life? And the bread. <clears throat> Likewise, it is difficult for disciples who have always loved and served the Lord to realize that they need something more because they usually have so much more than the average Christian. Nevertheless, we see Paul addressing such issues with the Ephesian church who had loved God and walked in faith. And you can see that in Ephesians 1.15. Now, when Paul spoke to the Ephesians, it was not the same as talking to the carnal Corinthians. He was addressing the cream of the crop. He says to them in Ephesians 1, 16 and 17, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. He's praying for church people. He's praying that their eyes will be open. Amen? Notice carefully the theme of his prayer. He prayed that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened, or, as Luke put it, that the disciples' eyes would no longer be restricted. We can see from this passage in Ephesians that their need to see Jesus in this new way was not limited to the 11 remaining disciples of Jesus. It is necessary that each of us make an Emmaus Road journey. The whole church yet needs to have its eyes open. If we go by the apostles' prayer. I mean, this is not just something he's teaching. It's something he's praying. It's something that he desires from the Lord for the people of God. That what? That we may see Jesus. Are we talking about a vision? No. Are we talking about some mysterious thing or a great mystery open? No, not really. Not, I mean, there. yes, you will see, you will understand things and whatever, but that's not what you're after. And that's where many people stumble is they say, I want to see Jesus. I want to come to a revelation of Christ. I want the Lord to open my eyes. But what they're looking for is all the knowledge that goes with that, and it's not a pure heart to see the Lord. The pure in heart shall see God. It's not, it's not, their motive is not pure. Their motive is so that they can be among the elite. Trust me, you're, there's nothing elite about it. You see that you're dead. You are elitely dead. <laughs> there is nothing elite about it. You see that Christ is your life. You see that you, you've heard it a million times, now you see it. And only in seeing does it become effectual. Only as the Spirit of God opens our eyes. So you can read book after book. Anybody ever done that? I mean, I, I, when I first started hearing about the Lord in this manner, I got hold of every book that I could, and I happened to be in a blessed situation where I had available at my fingertips some of the best books, probably better than I have in my library right now. And so I read and I read and I read. And what happened? My mind, I started getting all this inform new information, different information than the charismatic movement was telling me. It didn't, it didn't put down that. It didn't say that God's still not God and 
all the things that we knew, all the things that these disciples knew prior to this. It was not voided out. Well, you know, it wasn't all voided out. That's not, no, no. how do you, you build on something? You know what I'm saying? You're building as you go. But you don't build a certain place and go, well, this is it. This is all of it, you know. Well, the way that you can tell if you're building a house, if this is all of it is, if you're sitting there on what you've laid down and the storms are still beating the fool out of you. Then you go, you know what? I don't think, I don't think this is finished. There's got to be some more. <laughs> Does that make sense? There's got to be something more. And that's a good question or a good statement. There's got to be something more. I, and this is my personal belief, I don't ever want to give up on that statement. <coughs> I don't ever want to give up. I want to always say in myself, there's got to be more of Jesus. There's got to be more of Jesus. I can't be satisfied with what I've got. Amen. You know, you look at Job, and he looked like he knew, according to the scriptures, he knew more than everybody in the East. He was, you know... Was God satisfied with what he knew? Apparently not. Apparently not. You know? And I would rather stay hungry instead of get to a place, a plateau, camp, start camping, and then have the Lord send a storm that tears up my tent. You know? Enjoyed your little camping time? Well, it's time to move on. All right. So... <clears throat> Um, the last paragraph on 17, don't you feel like we're really moving out? <laughs> As was stated earlier, the Emmaus road journey is purpose for the opening of the eyes of disciples and not the eyes of sinners. Few have heard of such a journey. Most of us are ready to make the discipleship commitment to Jesus for three years and stay with him for that amount of time. How many believers understand that three years will not satisfy God's intention for them? What then is left for disciples long after all the truths have been spoken, after all the miracles have been seen, and all the experiences have taken place? There is still an emptiness within a believer at the end of that time, and God will say that he needs a small group of disciples to walk the journey with him, and Emmaus Road Journey is looking for those who will give themselves to this journey, to this time, to this trip. All right, Luke 24 and verse 16 uh, through 18. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Interesting, they're talking about the resurrection of Jesus. Did you know that? <laughs> but Jesus is saying to him, what, what, kind of, what are you talking about that's making you so sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cloephas, answered, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? So now remember, they're, they're saying, Jesus, you don't know what's going on? Oh, except they don't know it's Jesus, by the way. So it would be more like, dude, you don't know what's going on? You need to get in the know. We'll tell you. We will inform you. We'll bring you up to speed, dude, person, guy. And yet Jesus has appeared to them as a stranger so that they can begin afresh without any bearings. Only the Holy Spirit will take them in through this veil. Only the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> this, uh, this journey was different than the years the disciples had spent with Jesus. Before Jesus' death and resurrection, they would grow excited over a demon being cast out or Jesus working a miracle. At that stage, those experiences were the pinnacle for the disciples' walk with Jesus. Today, some believers seem to be content at their present stage with the Lord Jesus and are not seeking for a greater relationship with him. This very fact emphasizes that this journey is only for those who have identified and unexplained. Here's, this is an important sentence. 
This very fact emphasizes that this journey is only for those who have identified an unexplained dissatisfaction within themselves. Now, I want, I want to make something plain here. It says this very fact emphasizes that this journey is only for those. This journey is not for everybody. Okay. If the subject is, let's all go out of here, knock on three doors, and try to lead salvation, lead people to salvation, salvation is for everybody, right? And, you know, there's questions about this and that. But for sure, this journey is not for everybody. It's actually only for certain ones at a certain time in their walk where they have found that they've been with the Lord, they've seen the Lord move, they've experienced the Lord in incredible ways, and yet they've continued until they've come to a place of dissatisfaction. They're not dissatisfied with the Lord, but there's a sense of emptiness. There's a sense of longing for something more. There's a sense of sort of wandering. Anybody ever had that sense of just like, uh, you know, like the children of Israel in the wilderness? Were you just wandering? Oh, yeah, God's with us, but I'm not sure where we're going. And it doesn't feel like he knows where we're going. <laughs> I mean, it must have felt that way in the wilderness. Doesn't, you know, God's leading us, but, you know, he keeps going round and round in this wilderness. You know. So this is a real important point. This thing may not hit home to everybody. You may be at a certain point. And for you, God begins to open your eyes to some things, and you want to go share that with the world. You go, oh, my God, oh, you know. But they're, go, you know, they're content with where they're at right at that moment. No need trying to force anything on anyone. Let God deal with them in their life. All right, so uh, only the hungry are even spiritually ready to make such a journey. In the case of these disciples, they had become discouraged, right? Could you tell by the, the, the discourse? They had become discouraged and were therefore open to finding Jesus in a way that was greater than what they had known of him previously. Jesus knew their hearts, though. He also knew that their minds were stuck in the old view of him. These disciples did not just need new information, and that's important, too. So, folks, don't let this, these classes be new information. Don't do it. With all your heart, ask the Lord, ask the Holy Spirit to break the bread of life to you. We don't need more classes. We don't need more seminars. We need Jesus. We need the real Jesus. We need something. And don't let a, even a religious setting fool you. Come hungry, go, you know, push past, you know, remember the woman with the issue of blood who pushed past everybody and got hold of Jesus. Do that. You say, well, I've done that, you know, at 10 different points in my walk with the Lord. Well, how about just stay that way? Just stay that way. So we don't just need new information, or they didn't. They need an in-depth encounter with Jesus again. It is for this reason that he drew near to them. And I, said, I wrote that because the dissatisfaction, the discouragement, the hunger, the lack, the sort of confusion that was at work in their lives was actually working for them. See, we want to be the ones who never have any confusion or discouragement we want to be the one but you know what hunger leads to finding food do you know that hunger god put hunger in us do you know that it's this desire for food and so you know he puts this dissatisfaction we don't we can't believe that's the lord oh that's not the lord the Lord would only make me have happy feet or happy feelings or whatever, you know. That's the Lord. But the Lord wouldn't actually allow me to be discouraged. Well, he would allow you to be discouraged with your present 
course or your present condition, just like he would allow you to get hungry, physically hungry, to go say, you need to go eat. And, and see, most people, you know, some people never really experience hunger. You know why? Because they eat all the time. <laughs> I mean, you know, they don't, you know, most people in this country don't even know real hunger. Well, you know, it's not hunger, it's a little, you know, your stomach goes, okay. You know, if you, if you listen to your stomach sometimes, it sounds like a selfish little person in there. <laughs> Feed me now. You know, well, what I've found is if you ignore it and go a little longer, it actually starts going down. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, it'll act up like a selfish little kid and go, I mean it, I mean it now, no, you know, because it knows that it's getting about to the point where it's going to go back down and have to shut up. And I'm saying, I need to, you, if you don't, I'm just going to, you know, explode. I'm, I'm going to get a headache. I'm going to be really sick. And then a few minutes later, you go, gosh, I was so hungry a while ago, and I'm not even hungry right now. What is the deal? You know? In my case, I don't even think to eat. Hardly ever. It doesn't come to me. I'll be working and my stomach will say eat, but it's so quiet in there that I don't hear much. And so Deb, like, puts a lunch right there in front of me and then calls. Did you eat? Yeah. Yeah, I think I did. No, I didn't. You know, that happens to me. All, I, I thought I ate, you know. And so, that, okay, I'm going to eat, you know. <clears throat> well, I would say that that's not normal. I would say that God put hunger in us and God put a hunger in us for Jesus. And that's normal that once you've gone for a certain amount of time and you've expended a certain amount of energy, you need to go after the Lord. You need to, once you've ministered you've served you've poured out it's time to fill back up can i get amen, amen. <clears throat> um let's see oh and then the last sentence there was it is for this reason that jesus drew near to them isn't it interesting that they're walking along and jesus shows up to them you know why jesus doesn't you know i don't know if you ever noticed one time I, start, I went through uh, the Gospels, and I just wanted to kind of look where Jesus went. And Jesus never went anywhere random. I mean, he always seemed to show up where somebody was hungry or somebody was needy or there was something, some open door to him. You know that? And uh, some of it is, is just, it's just weird. I mean, I remember, I can't, I can't remember all the details right now, but I remember doing a search, and... He ends up outside of Israel. He didn't do that very often. I think he was, I can't remember where he was at, Syria or somewhere. And he ends up out there, and he ends up ministering to somebody who's not even of Israel. And he came into that city, ministered to this woman, and then leaves and goes back into Israel. And I'm going, don't you think there's a lot more people out there who need Jesus? You know, that's that religious spirit. Oh, I mean the, the common thought of the day. <clears throat> Don't you think there's more people out, you know? I mean, if, if we were there and in charge of evangelism and Jesus was working for us, we would have said to Jesus, Don't you think there's more people than this, this one lady out here in this city that needs Jesus? I am Jesus. I know who's ready for me, who needs me. You know? We... We say, no, there's a task. There's a cause. We do what we do because there's a cause. No, we don't either. I believed that way for years. I did because there was a cause. But eventually the Holy Spirit said, you don't do something because there's a cause because then you're no different than the radicals of da-da-da-da or the Black Panther or the this or the that. Everybody's got a cause and you just got this cause. You do it because Christ is your life to do it. You do it because you're moved in the energy of the life of Jesus to do it. It's not this external cause. You know, 
you carry a banner. I mean, I know all about it in the 60s, you know, and your, your banner says, this is my cause, and we're, you know, we want this changed. Folks, then you're nothing more than a radical. No, God didn't give us a cause. God is trying to impart his purpose to our hearts, not just to our minds. And he's trying to do that based on oneness. <clears throat> All right, I keep stopping and talking. Let me make sure I finish the, yes. I'm going to read one more paragraph, and then we're going to stop because it's over with. <clears throat> when Jesus drew near, the disciples did not even recognize him. He was a stranger to them, so they did not know him. Surely, if anyone would recognize Jesus, a disciple would. They had spent years with him during those three and a half years that they had spent with Jesus. They did not feel like he was a stranger. If you talk with them about uh, anything they knew of the Jesus that they had walked with for those years or for these years, they could, uh, they could commune with you. They knew and communed with Jesus of Nazareth. They knew his works. They knew his influence. They knew his miracles. And they knew his words. All right, we're going to stop right there. I need somebody, uh, Ryan or somebody, if you'll mark that for me, uh, bottom of page 18, and we'll continue there. Anybody getting anything out of this? <clears throat> you know, it's just so, so important that we don't fall into a religious rut here. That we really keep our hearts tender and that we say, Jesus is everything and he's what my life is about right now. And you have to do that not just in the classes. Come on. Come on. Jesus is not part-time. I remember years ago in my early going, somebody said, uh, are you a full-time worker for Jesus? I said, yeah. And they said, well, what, what do you do? And I said something like, well, I lead worship on Wednesday nights for the church. I thought you said you were full-time. I'm full-time for Jesus. I am full on, full out, full time for Jesus. You know, as far as what I do back, you know, an example, and I'll stop this, but Stephen, you know, they asked him to wait on tables. That was part of his ministry. But when the ministry was over, he'd go down to the synagogue and start sharing with everybody. And, you know, and the Lord start moving and used him mightily. Whoa. You know, some people, some churches would say, now, Brother Stephen, you need to stick with the ministry of waiting on tables. You don't need to be going down there stirring up trouble. You know, uh, that's not, you know, that's really not your ministry. Folks, your ministry is Jesus. Your ministry is to do what God calls you to do right now. Yes, he'll open the doors. He'll show you things later on as far as specifics and whatever but in the meantime whatever your hand finds to do do it heartily as unto the Lord amen, amen. let's pray Father, we just thank you so much for your Son and the life of your Son and the Holy Spirit who breaks the bread that is the Son the bread of life we just want to be melted into him. We want to be molded by the, the potter into his image. We want to flow in oneness with his life. We want beyond what we can ask or think. We want what you want. And we're sorry that our minds limit that at times. So help us, Lord, not to just think outside of the box, but to think as if there were no box. To step behind the veil and see as you see. Yes, Father, we fail, we get distracted, we, we get caught up in things that we like of this earth. But we want to tell you that our heart is with you. And we want you to move in such a way that these mountains will be moved out of the way. In Jesus' name.
Amen. All right, take a break, and we'll come back in a few minutes.